Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. Fine, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal. On this Wednesday, July 25th, 2018, day in our calendar, Greg Anthony here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Yes, get ready for an hour, a jam-packed hour of really good information that you don't get elsewhere. And we talk about a lot of information on this show that's really out of our control to do any changing about what's going on. But basically, you can change yourself. And this show kind of is based on a cultural phenomenon going on in the last, especially since 9-11, how so many people distrust uh, the power centers of our world. For example, uh, I would guess if you did a poll on Congress, well, they have, uh, Congress has a 8 to 10 percent approval rating, uh, and usually the presidency has a has a 40 35 to 40 percent and that's usually based on partisan issues but what I'm getting at is over the years uh, there is such a distrust in the seats of power in our in our world that a lot of issues arise that I don't think we would discuss if we had honest people controlling our major religions if we had honest people controlling our major governments and this complete distrust has now seeped down in America to the media where no one really trusts what they hear on CNN or Fox. All they trust is what they believe to be true, and they turn it on basically. For example, if you're a Trump supporter, you're going to turn off CNN very quickly because you can't take it. If you're a Hillary Clinton or a Democratic supporter that despises Trump, you're going to turn off Fox News just like that. Now, what about if you're a person like me who listens to it all and kind of laughs at it? And the reason is, once you start searching for the answers, the difficult answers, you start realizing that all these people work together. And really, you start deciding, who is this hidden hand behind all of this? What is going on in the world? And today, I want to talk about some of the the Vatican's biggest secrets, and they're pretty obvious. I mean, we've dealt with these for a long, long time on this show. And like I said yesterday on my show, I gave people an idea how I got involved with this. I, I was in Rome during the Vatican Bank scandal, which made national news, but the real uh, problems that caused that scandal never really did. And uh, it opened my eyes to the Vatican connection to the New World Order and their real control over politics in the world, their unbelievable wealth, and their system of Luciferian doctrine that's hidden in Catholicism, using Jesus as a cover. And this kind of duplicitousness, uh, this kind of duplicity, that way I got one of those two two words right, is evident in most every walk, you know, every area of society. And let me just talk to you a little bit before I get into uh, the Vatican being the biggest financial power on earth. Just a little summary of it, because we've done n- a numerous shows on that. Uh, let me say, when I was back in Rome, I remember when the Vatican Bank scandal hit, I was very shocked at what I was hearing, and I didn't believe it in the beginning. And as I started to research the facts, watching the foreign, well, the European newspapers who were giving me more information than I could ever get from America, uh, I started to really realize that the Vatican is a power in itself. And my first thought was, boy, I would love to get into the Vatican Library to listen to or to hear and to see and to read all of those secrets and then I started realizing how protected it is and how uh, fortified it is. I mean it's not a library where every Catholic can go into and peruse 
all of the treasures that they have hoarded throughout the centuries. And much of the information is only seen by uh, uh, eyes that basically are working together to control the world again for Rome. And when you say that, people roll their eyes and go, oh, that's impossible. The Roman Empire fell year, hundreds of thousands of years ago. What are you talking about? Well, anyway, let me just tell you what goes on. So your, your belief system of how government works changes immensely when you start understanding the Vatican role. Then, of course, I was brought up as a Catholic. And, you know, deep down inside, I believed in Jesus. I very, even in 1982, I don't think I ever read the Bible. And I started looking at some of the spiritual aspects of this organization and reading all types of articles about their involvement in the occult, their involvement in, uh, you know, pedophilia, in Luciferianism, and their involvement in all of these things that seem to lead people away from Jesus. But publicly, they, they, they talked a good game like they're basically the Pope is the vicar and the and Christ on earth and uh, the people are given this public story and behind the scenes there's something else going on and even back then I remember my belief system is okay I believe there is a God I believe Jesus existed and died on the cross etc and you know there's a there's a time in your life as a Catholic you got going well is this just a story come on uh, but I remember being, uh, there was a book that came out called The Messianic Legacy. This was during my, it came out during the time I was in Rome. And what it did is it uh, talked about the bloodlines of Christ that live on. That Christ really didn't die on the cross. He married Mary Magdalene. They had children and his bloodline lives on. They hid out in, a, in France and etc., etc., etc. And so I found that, that the Vatican, I talked to a couple bishops about it, or high-level Vaticanites, and they said, well, you know, there's this group that always blackmails us, and they come out with this story, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And make a long story short, after researching it, because it interested me, I said, wow, did Jesus really die on the cross? I mean, the book seemed documented. So I kind of followed it up and followed the trail and found out that it wasn't as uh, factually documented as it said and basically uncovered that the information is leaked by people in the Jesuit order themselves. So they're leaking this information, creating this kind of uh, schism between believers and non-believers. And, you know, I always said this, Catholics, really the hierarchy uh, of the Vatican could care less whether you're an atheist, could care less whether you, uh, you know, what you are, except if you're a total Bible believer that wants to talk about the truth of the Vatican, then they don't like it because basically anything that inhibits their power, they are going to try to destroy if they do not bow down to the Vatican. So when we look at Protestantism, that was based on protest, right? Protest against uh, papal power. Today, Protestants have come back into under the umbrella of Rome. All you have to do is read policies of Protestants in America now, the Protestant churches, and they all accept Rome, which is a big mistake. So the Vatican gets its way. As long as you bow down to the Pope, everything's okay, right? Now, the Vatican, like I said, is the biggest financial power on this earth. It's uh, probably the largest corporation in the United States, when you look at this as not a church, with assets that total more than U.S. Steel, AT&T, Standard Oil, all together, you know, combined. Now, the Vatican is second only to the U.S. tax system when it comes to annual revenue. And I would bet that they exceed that, considering all of their agreements in over 200 concordates, which is a agreement with a country, signed a treaty which gives the Vatican special 
favors in a country, and they've got over 200 of them signed. A lot of them just after the fake Cold War ended. But the most troubling part of the Vatican lies in their ties to all things connected to the New World Order, the occult, and uh, the term Illuminati. Remember there was a movie, uh, Angels and Demons, which depicted the, they came right out, and basically there was a plot in the movie to destroy the Vatican. And uh, Tom Hanks came to the rescue as this researcher who was trying to figure out what was going on. And what the movie talked about was there was this bad element, this Illuminati bad element inside the Vatican trying to destroy the good church, trying to destroy the good people of the church and the Pope. And in the end, uh, the Illuminati didn't get their way. But the movie was fallacious in its press, in its, it was a Dan Brown book turned into a movie uh, funded by the Vatican. Much of the money came from them. And then, of course, uh, Ron Howard and Tom Hanks got together with the Cardinals and they did the movie for Mary, you know, done in English and then sent all over the world. But the, the major, pre, the major uh, uh, storyline was wrong because they said that there was a good element at the top levels of the Vatican. And my thinking is that <laughs> if you do the research, they are the Illuminati. They are the New World Order. And so this idea that good overcame evil in the Vatican was, not, was misrepresented in that movie because at the top levels there is no good. And uh, to give you an idea, at every Easter service, uh, they will... In, in Latin, the opening little song is actually uh, proclaiming, you know, telling you that they're worshiping Luc Lucifer in this service. Those are the words. That's what they tell you. But still, people will not believe it. And I find that quite, you know, quite disheartening. Now, I, like I said, I grew up as a Catholic, so I, I know all about their rituals. And as I was going through them as a young child, I didn't. I thought it was bringing me closer to God. Uh, I thought that I had to do it because, you know, it's part of the disciplinary uh, system that I went to, Catholic school. And there's another gentleman that was watching a, an interesting video, which I might play. Uh, it's called The Ten Biggest Secrets of the Vatican. And I might do it just for kicks to see what it's about. Uh, and he wrote something, and he said, uh, he was also, he said, here are just a few of my own personal thoughts. Here are just a few of my own personal thoughts about the Vatican. He says, I went to a Catholic school when I was younger, so I know a bit about them. And I, you know, I know that. I went to a Catholic uh, kindergarten, grade school, high school, Notre Dame high school. And he says, Catholic Mass is a very ritualistic affair without any healing being done by the congregation that I've ever seen. All power and control, he says, seems to be given to a priest, which is absolutely not biblical. You know, I didn't know anything about You don't get the Bible when you go to Catholic school. And I don't, don't ever remember reading it till I was in my uh, 40s, I think. And Jesus wanted people to go out and heal others, he says, and teach them about God not just sit in a pew and listen to the priest. We should all be priests and evangelists as much as possible. My questions to a Catholic priest would be how many people they are healing and how many new souls are they saving. If they say they don't do this, then I would, uh, then I would never consider going to that church. If I was a Catholic, I would see if the church could be changed from within to let everybody participate in praying for healing, for example. If not, why would I go to the church that would not do what Jesus told me to do? Well, we know that the Vatican, once you get, you're in it like I was and then out of it, you can see and you start piecing together all these rituals that have nothing to do. Uh, they're basically uh, a cult, satanic, based on the sun god, etc., etc. But you can't tell Catholics that. And uh, anytime you get involved, you go into a Catholic church, there's a mass going on. When you talk to people afterwards uh, and you start talking about these ideas, they think you're a heretic. And as the Jesuits say, heretics can be killed and it's not murder. So 
<laughs> go, go think about it. That's what's going on. And for anyone ever to, whether you're born into the Catholic faith or whether you're looking at it from afar, to get to the bottom of what they're all about at the high levels, that to me, uh, that to me is uh, difficult. And many people can't make that leap. Now, he says this, Catholics are great people, but many things Catholics are taught are not things Jesus taught. And uh, the only thing I could say is that anytime you start criticizing the Vatican, you, your opponents will always say you're Catholic bashing, you hate Catholics, and it's really not true. But most Catholics will believe that. Now, he says here, Jesus never told us to blindly give power and authority to somebody with a funny pointed fish hat, for example. Well, that's true. And what is that? To start looking at what that fish hat, uh, what it really means. Just like I tell people, why are these obelisks in Vatican Square, in London, in, in America? And boy, that's a story in itself, and we've done many shows on that. So um, start looking at the connections between ISIS, who ISIS really was in history. Why did they name this terrorist group they funded and started ISIS and all these obelisks? And what is their end game? The Catholic Church fought for a long time to be the only ones who could read God's word. And, uh, you know, you know that story. The Jesuits were created to uh, kill Protestants in the Protestant Reformation because the Catholic Church saw they were losing power. They wanted to be the only ones to interpret the Bible for the people. In fact, they still will tell you that you're not able to do that yourself and you're not able to interpret it because it's too difficult. Allow a priest to do it. And how many priests? I've met many over the years that have come out of the Catholic Church and they usually are the church's harshest critics. So there's a lot of bad and evil history in the Vatican to be sure. And I've spent a lot of years trying to look at that and to tell people about it so they could read it on their own. You know, this man says this, I don't, I don't believe God would want anybody to follow a pope who is speaking any evil against God's word or pushing the New World Order agenda at this, as this current pope, the Jesuit pope, has done again and again. Now that falls onto deaf ears to many of the millennials in our country, many of the young people in our country who are being steered by Jesuitism towards democratic socialism or communism, and it's an amazing story. Uh, they, are, they, they believe that the, when the Pope starts talking about a global agenda, they believe it's a good thing that the world all be one and borders are erased. But you will understand they don't care about the millennials once they get the power, that total power. And what's going on now in the world could be in one of the final scenarios here for World War III. You're seeing the battle lines being drawn. You're seeing the last vestige of American, make America great again, being harnessed together by Trump. And I believe he's there to show exactly where America stands now and to, to label and to point out publicly who the people are, that the, who are the Jesuit enemy, who is the Vatican enemy. And it's all the people that support Trump is, is a good place to start because the Vatican does not believe in a, in a free democracy or republic. They do not believe in free speech. They do not believe in, in freedom of religion. And the reason they, they were backing the Constitution was so that they could get their foot in the door in America when they were not allowed to uh, be here or they were not, Catholics were not allowed to hold power here. But once that freedom of religion clause was embedded in our Constitution, that gave them a foot in the door and look at how they've grown here. But their goal is to take away your freedom of religion once they receive, once they get enough power. And you're seeing that by getting Trump in there and driving this agenda now, this America first agenda, you're seeing the battle lines being drawn here. Hatred, almost like a civil war mentality. 
people not wanting to talk to each other anymore. Uh, the, the right wing, the left wing democratic socialists now are calling for people to be, anybody who supports Trump, especially those in his cabinet, to, to be harassed at restaurants, to, to not allow, they shouldn't be allowed to go into public anymore. So you're seeing this kind of division that is being orchestrated it's a it's a typical Jesuit plot. They've done it many times in many different countries. And what they're doing, you know, looking at it, they're isolating those who are supporting Trump and they're saying, okay, these are the people that we have to get rid of. And how are we going to do it? So right now you got about half and half, right? You got a country ready to go to war with itself over what? Over globalism versus and nationalism is what it boils down to. Now, the, uh, you know, the Vatican doesn't teach to go out and cast out demons as Jesus did to do anything like that. They want to hoard all this knowledge and give all power to a priest. And we said earlier, it's not biblical at all. Now, this man says, my biggest problem with the Vatican is the secrets. Uh, secrets they keep in their secret library and the massive wealth they keep. God would want most of this wealth, so would the dogs, to go to saving more souls, give it to the poor and feeding the poor. Uh, you know, God would not approve of this r ridiculous wealth sitting around in Vatican vaults and also the wealth of knowledge in the Vatican library, of course. And it, it's estimated that if the Vatican would you know, come clean on its money, which they never will, there wouldn't be poverty in the world. Oh, they dole out a little bit here and there to make it seem like they are the benevolent benefactors of, of the poor and their charitable organizations are humanitarian in nature. But are they really humanitarian in nature? All you have to look is an old... Uh, go to a story I did a long time ago with Father Edmund Walsh, of a Jesuit priest. He started the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And what he did was he brokered a deal with Western money to make sure that Stalin got into power so that he could go and kill millions of Jews and millions of Orthodox Christians. But he went there in the guise of going as a Catholic charity to feed the poor in Russia who were starving because of the Bolshevik Revolution. That's what they do many times. That's what they do. And uh, anyway, uh, they use, they publicly let people think they're the most humanitarian and God-loving people in the world. And many, many of the Catholics, many of the Catholics are at the lower levels. But like I said, the two most important things you can do in your life, even if you never can change outwardly what's going to happen, is to understand the faith you were brought into and then expand on it, and to understand the country and the politics you were brought into and then expand on it. Uh, I think in the second half, and I wanted to do something today, and I put uh, I was going to do it first, but I think I'll spend the next half hour doing it. There was a Flat Earth Convention in Birmingham, not in Alabama, but in Birmingham uh, in the UK. And this was the first of its kind. And I'm not going to get into whether the earth is flat or round. I know I get a lot of flack over it when I even bring up the subject. But I want to look at why it's grown, this popularity of this, this organization, these flat earthers, has grown massively in numbers. And I think it's, again, the idea that we distrust anything in power right now. And we have good reason to do that. And people are fed up with scientists, you know, telling them what to do. People are fed up with politicians and political leaders and religious leaders telling them what to do. So my uh, question to you then is, outside of, you know, focusing on flat earth or round earth, why don't you focus on not really understanding what the Pope is all about and the Jesuit black Pope and how these people operate and use your energies to get rid of them. Back in three minutes on the investigative journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. 
you will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The following program is labeled dangerous and off-limits by the supreme Jesuit command. But stand tall, people. Listen up, and you may just learn something. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the investigative journal. And this half hour, I wanted to talk about the flat earth phenomena and uh, how I found out about it, my thoughts about it over the years, the uh, flack I've gotten for talking about the flat earth, and then most importantly, I think a shift in power, uh, a shifting of power to spread information has led to the resurgence of all of these ideas. And uh, you see that on the internet. Uh, now, the flat earth phenomena is interesting because I think it shows a, a major distrust in uh, people controlling your lives, uh, the politicians, the scientists, etc. Uh, and I think people really uh, are doing a little bit more research on their own 
and I guess you've got a choice. I mean, there are a lot of people interested in this. If you're not, uh, you're going to end up relying on other people too. And I guess you have to sometimes. I mean, every time you hop on an airplane, a uh, commercial airplane, you better hope the pilot knows what he's doing, right? But anyway, the flat earth. Okay, let's look at it from uh, when, you, when you were a child. I grew up looking at a globe in every classroom that I remember. And I remember spinning that globe and then closing my eyes and pointing my finger and saying, wow, I'm going to end up in Fiji, you know, the game you play. So you grow up with this idea that the earth is round. You also grow up with the idea, and that when you're young, you don't question, okay, we're round, but what about those things in the sky? Okay, what about them? You get up in them, you know, at night, you get up uh, and you look out at the stars and you say, oh, there's stars, there's a sun, there's a moon. And then you start learning that there's these planets, but you never see them. You're told, and then you you walk, you look at you look at pictures and books, and they show you the Milky Way, and they show you Venus, and all of these different planets, and you grow up thinking that's it. But however, what happens then is you get a little bit smarter, and you start saying, "Oh, they tell me that the Earth rotates all the you know goes around the sun, and." Does this uh, blah, 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 the earth is rotating, the sun is the major uh, stationary, and we rotate around it. And then you start saying gravity, and you start thinking. And if you're, you know, basically just a normal average Joe, that's about as far as your knowledge goes. But what happens when, and you start thinking, wow, uh, these people in the olden times, they thought the earth was flat. And basically, people were going to fall off the earth if they kept going. Boy, were they stupid. Look how smart NASA is. But what happens is, let's say you start reading the Bible and you start thinking in terms of biblical, what Genesis says. Now, as I grew up as a kid in Catholicism, we never even read Genesis. But if you look at Genesis, most Bible believers will tell me that the earth is station the earth is stationary and the sun and the moon revolve around it and there will be a split in opinion whether it's round or whether it is flat now that really and this idea of genesis the world created in seven days etc etc or six days and then god rested on the seventh day that that meets a lot of uh, criticism and so you're seeing that uh, that same thinking will go, boy, those old people that wrote the Bible, they were sure stupid. Uh, and is God stupid that he, he created a flat earth or he created an earth uh, that is stationary when I'm told NASA tells us we're not? And who's smarter, the scientists or, or the Bible? And most people will, will, will uh, believe the scientists and think that anybody that has these spiritual ideas about Genesis being literal a little interpretation of Genesis are crazy. And that's really where it goes. So what happens is, I remember, once you start, look, you go a little farther now. And once you start thinking in terms of, wow, they really lied to me when they said we went to the moon. And you do all that research. And then you start researching really what NASA does and all of their photos being the computer composites, right? And all of this stuff starts to say, well, if they lied to me about that, why did they? maybe they're lying to me about really what the Earth is, the shape of the Earth. Now, during shows I've done, I said, yeah, you know, there's a lot of scientific evidence that the Earth isn't round. And then there's a lot of evidence that it is round. And as a layman, you can do a few things. The one thing that I've always been, that been, you know, I've done a couple experiments on my own. And it's always to do with the horizon. not And the curvature of the earth, I might add. That's what I'm talking about, the curvature of the earth. And NASA gives you figures. And if you follow those figures and do tests, they can't be true. And so you automatically say, well, if the curvature isn't like NASA says, it has to be flat. Then you get up in an airplane at 30,000 feet, 
and you see that if you're up that high, you should see a curve and you don't. It's just completely flat. Your eyes, you go to the horizon, the level of the horizon. And so you start wondering if they lie to me about the shape of the earth, about the curvature, what else are they lying about? Can they be lying about gravity? Does gravity really exist? And is it really just the old idea that what goes up must come down? And that every, every, a rocket they've 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 uh, sent up came down, never getting as far as they tell you, and then these this idea of well they got satellites up there well are they really up there? The only pictures I ever seen don't look too good and they're all computer graphics, and they say there's thousands and thousands and you never see any of them crash, uh, and it's crazy. And then you get the guy that does your TV, and you start going okay Direct TV. Where's your satellite? And he says, oh, no, 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 we use an antenna. Well, then why do you say you're a satellite company? <laughs> okay, so what I'm getting at is this question that people now, ever since, especially in the last 30 years with the, with the Internet being what it is and this kind of blatant uh, power structure of the world being exposed to more people and how we're being lied to on so many levels, it's natural for a group of people now to get together and say, yes, the old timers were right. The earth is not round. So uh, this man, let me see how much time we got here. He uh, went to this convention in, this was just last April, in uh, Birmingham in the UK. And he watched an entire Flat Earth convention for the research he's doing with this article. And here's what he learned. And he says, speakers recently flew in from around or perhaps across, uh, get it, yeah, the earth for a three-day event held in Birmingham, the UK's first ever public flat earth convention. So it's the UK's first ever. Somebody's going to email me and go, there was a convention in, in Joplin, Missouri in 1973. Okay, good for you. This is the Birmingham convention that was recently held. It's timely. It was well attended. A lot of people were there, he says, and it wasn't just three days of speeches and YouTube clips through, though granted there was a number of those. There was also a lot of team building, networking, debating, workshops, and scientific experiments. Yes, the flat earthers do seem to place a lot of emphasis on, and priority on scientific methods, and in particular on observable facts. Yes, they do. The weekend, in no small part, revolved around discussing and debating science, with lots of time spent running, planning, and reporting on the latest set of flat earth experiments and models. So people are interested. Why? They feel lied to. This is a cultural phenomenon, not just whether, like I said, if you believe the earth is flat or round, so be it. I'm not here to sway you one way or the other. And, you know, for all practical purposes, the earth is flat for me, like today I went out and played baseball on a flat diamond uh, surface. Uh, I went to the store and the surface seemed to be flat. Uh, everywhere I drive it's flat and I guess the only way it wouldn't be is when you're going up in the mountains or down into a cave or whether you're diving or you're skydiving. So everything is flat for practical purposes. Now what relies beyond is the question. What lies beyond? So yes, the flat earthers seem to place a lot of emphasis and priority on these scientific methods and these observable facts. And one of those are like what I talk about, you know, measuring distances and using lasers to say, hey, I'm shooting that laser 10 miles, there should be a curvature and it shouldn't reach and hit the same point at the level at the same level. How come? The weekend, in no small part, this man says, revolved around discussing and debating science. Lots of time spent running and planning and reporting on the latest set of flat earth experiments. That would interest me. And models. Indeed, as one presenter noted early on, flat earthers try to, quote, look for multiple and verifiable evidence. Well, what's wrong with that? And advised attendees to, quote, always do your own research and accept and accept you might be wrong. I don't know, 
you know, you can only do your own research. I mean, that's nothing wrong with that. While flat earthers seem to trust and support scientific methods, what they don't trust is scientists. And I might add, NASA. I mean, they can't trust NASA. And uh, the established rule, and NASA has a $92 billion annual budget. People ask me, why, if the Earth is round, why would they, if it is flat, why would they lie? $92 billion reasons. And the established relationships between power and knowledge, they don't trust us anymore. This is a cultural phenomenon everywhere you go. This relationship between power and knowledge has long, theor has long been theorized by sociologists, hasn't it? By exploring these relationships, we begin to understand why there is a swelling resurgence of flat earthers. And people ask me that. You know, this has only been a recent phenomenon in the last, what, eight, six to eight years? And it has to do with an increasing distrust of people in power. Now, power and knowledge. Let me begin, this gentleman says, by staring, starting quickly, stating quickly that I'm not really interested in discussing if the Earth is flat or, for the record, if it's a globe. And he's not interested. Hey, that's good. I'm, at times, I'm not interested in doing that either. I'm interested in saying, let's put this on the table at least to get away from the other serious topics of the Vatican-led New World Order for a change. And I'm not seeking, he says, to mock or denigrate this community of flat earthers. What's important here is not necessarily whether anyone believes the earth is flat or not, but instead what the flat earthers' resurgence and public conventions tell us about science and the knowledge in the 21st century. Now, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Let me discuss those who believe in the Bible. How does that, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning? What, what are your thoughts? If, you know, does Genesis tell you more about the truth than the modern day scientists? And when you go to bed, what do you believe? Or do you just say, well, it's really not important whether the earth is stationary or not? Well, it is. Because if it's not stationary, then God is misleading you, right? So can you trust the rest of the Bible? Is what I'm getting at. Now, throughout the weekend, he says, multiple competing models of Earth shapes were suggested, including classic flat Earth, domes, ice walls, diamonds, puddles, and multiple worlds inside, and even the Earth as the inside of a giant cosmic egg. However, the discussion often did not revolve around the models on offer, but on a broader issues of attitudes towards existing structures of knowledge and the institutions that supported and presented these structures. And that, that's interesting. Now, flat earthers are not the first group to be skeptical of existing power structures and their tight grasp on knowledge. Most any, you know, look at today, folks. Uh, any truth organization. It's built on that premise. You don't trust the existing power structure and their tight grasp on knowledge, and you're not going to give them the benefit of the doubt anymore, and you're going to assume that your government lies. You're going to assume that scientists lie, and then you're going to work from there. Now, going back to this gentleman's article, and he doesn't give his name, uh, this viewpoint is somewhat typified by the work of Michael uh, Foucault, a famous and heavily influential 20th century philosopher who made a career of studying those on the fringes of society to understand what they could tell us about everyday life. Now, if you're a Bible believer, you're on the fringe of society right now, right? If you're a flat earther, you're on the fringe of society. If you're a believer in 9-11 truth, you're, you're, you're a... Uh, on the fringe of society. If you believe that the Vatican is in control of your governments and basically is up to no good and the, and the Vatican-led New World Order is reality, you're on the fringe of society, correct? So what does that tell us about everyday life? Now he, this man, is well known among many other things for looking at the close relationships between power and knowledge. He suggested that knowledge is created 
and used in a way that reinforces the claims to legitimacy of those in power. At the same time, that those in power control what is considered to be correct and incorrect knowledge. That is the key to this whole truth movement in any area you look at. If they control the knowledge, they have more power. And so you have to ask the question, is their knowledge correct? Is what you're being given correct? And I can say throughout the course of my life, that I've been lied to more times by people in power than I care to admit. Now, according to Mr. Foucault, there is therefore an intimate and interleaked relationship between power and knowledge. Now, without going into what he's thinking and the rest of this article right now, let me just say this. What, is that, what does that sentence bring to your mind? There's therefore an intimate and interlinked relationship between power and knowledge. To me, I immediately say, I don't believe those in power. They're using knowledge to control me, and I want to find out the truth. That immediately puts you on the fringe of society, right? When you say, I don't trust anything that comes out of a politician's mouth or that priest's mouth up on the altar, then you're immediately on the fringe. Now, what does that tell you about everyday life? Your everyday life is going to be changed, right? You're not going to walk around saying, wow, I'm going to take that as complete fact because they told me so. And so at the time Mr. Foucault was writing on the topic, the control of power and knowledge had moved away from religious institutions who previously held a very singular hold over knowledge and morality and was instead beginning to move towards a network of scientific institutions. Now, I think when I hear that sentence, I go, you know something? That is basically true on the surface, but these religious institutions, and i.e. the Vatican, have morphed into these scientific communities. And they're part of it. And basically, they're using this to gain power. And so we have these scientific network institutions, media monopolies, legal courts, and bureaucratized governments. And I think the serious mistake that people make, though, is to separate these from the religious institution, especially the Vatican, because together you have to understand both the spiritual and the political to and the you know the political narratives to really understand what's going on. Now Foucault argued that these institutions work to maintain their claims to legitimacy by controlling knowledge. That's what we're all about here. We understand that, don't we? They've controlled the knowledge for so long and lied to you for so long. It's up to you to figure out who's lying and who's not. And that can take up a lot of time. And it also requires you to be nothing, you know, not to be just a person who is, follows the leader, one of these people that just follow the leader, a sheep going to the slaughter. What this requires is you to be a thinking individual. That's what the Vatican and the government officials who control power don't want. They want obedient servants and slaves to believe that they, they have the knowledge to con and you're going to listen to what they tell you. Now, that's basically, you would think, wouldn't you, that with the advent of the Internet and all this stuff, that people would get wise and start thinking about these things, and they do. But like uh, I have always mentioned, the people that control power understand this. They knew that people would start doing this, start thinking on their own. So they had to control this medium called the Internet. And that's what they do here. They're leading a lot of people in the wrong directions with misinformation. And this idea of fake news that you hear now, this word that Trump came up with, which was orchestrated, because everything in the mainstream now is fake, right? Fake, fake, fake. And then you look at the Internet and you think you're getting true, true, true. Well, you're not. You're getting a lot of fake, fake, fake there, too, guised in this idea that you're in a truth movement. So in the 21st century, we're witnessing another important shift in power and knowledge due to the factors that include the increased public platforms afforded by social media. Knowledge is no longer centrally controlled. Well, this I'm going to d disagree. It, well, on the surface, it's not. But do you believe that the Jesuits and the power people are just going to allow people 
to overcome what their to take over their power and use the internet to destroy them no way they've got to control it so they're going to give you the guys that power no longer is in their hands remember what i said when you think that your enemy is weak that's when he's the most dangerous and i think that's what they do with the internet they get people to believe that they have power when they really don't now you're seeing these movements of brexit of america first the trump movements and people are getting this idea that they're going to have power again. But I'm saying that this is all orchestrated because they are just trying to single those people out to see who their enemy really is, how many people are going to fall for this, and then destroy them. Now, everybody has the power to create and share content, right? When Michael Gove, a leading proponent of Brexit, proclaimed, I think the people of this country have had enough of experts. It would seem that he, in many ways, meant it. And of course we do. But where else? We, I still believe that we have to have truthful people that can help us along this way because there's no way any one individual can make it on his own. You're not an island in yourself. So there's going to have to come a point when you're going to have to trust somebody. And the Vatican Jesuits and the, and the power people really are using this idea, and I'm speaking here, uh, and I'm paraphrasing a lot here, uh, not paraphrasing, but adding a lot. Uh, they're using this idea that you can be an island in yourself. You'll have so much knowledge on your own. You don't need anybody. It's not true. And they're going to use this to isolate people, and they're really driving nuts. Because you're going to have to trust some people. And it's going to have to be honest scientists. It's going to have to be honest politicians. It's going to have to be honest clergymen. And that's the difference here. The Jesuits have been masters of deceit, masters of getting into these truth organizations and then making you believe you're getting the truth when, in fact, you're just being singled out to be destroyed. Now, back to this article. You're seeing an increased polarization in society, aren't you? As we continue to drift away from agreed singular narratives and move into camps around shared interests. Recent Pew research suggests, for example, that 80% of voters who backed Clinton in 2016 and 81% of Trump voters believe the two sides are unable to agree on basic facts. What I was talking about earlier, correct? Now, despite any early claims that a worldwide shared resource of knowledge such as the Internet would create peace, harmony, and common interpretation of reality, this idea comes as far back as H.G. Wells' World Brain Essays in 1936. It appears that quite the opposite is happening and lays credence to what I'm saying. It's not creating knowledge. This, this whole idea of shared knowledge is creating more strife, right? More of what the Jesuits will call the Hegelian dialectic, creating camps who hate each other and can't listen to each other anymore. And this is how they can work to basically rub these two groups together, create friction to get their own synthesis. And it appears that this is happening. And that's why when I say a global world isn't going to be a global world of peace, global world of strife. We're all out of time back in three minutes, back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. 
or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. 